Well, good morning, church. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's good to see you all here this morning. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and get started. Um, I'm sure there are others who will still join us as we start, um, and they will quietly um, fill in those seats behind you. But um, thank you for, for being here, and we look forward to a wonderful time of worship this morning as we gather together. We pray the Lord will meet with us. Um, we are still meeting during a COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and so there are protocols to be put in place, which includes uh, face masks for the duration of the service. So please do note that. Uh, we've also tried to social distance the chairs. Um, uh, but if you're from the same household, of course, we encourage you to all sit together. Uh, that is totally acceptable. Uh, please don't forget to fill out at the front your name and uh, take your temperature. I'm sure all of you have done that already and you've been helped in doing that. Um, as you can see, every week there's, a, 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 there's more additions to the, to the building and we are nearer to completion. Um, our toilets are almost up and running um, and so soon, perhaps within a, a week or so, we should have the availability of our toilet facilities. But in the meantime, we do thank you for your patience and uh, for bearing with us as we see and um, uh, as we watch the, the completion of this uh, building. But we, thank, we are thankful that we get to meet in this building nonetheless, even though it's not entirely done. And we thank all those who work tirelessly behind the scenes to set up. Uh, we must remember that during the course of the week, there are building constructing um, happening here. There are workers that are um, working in this building. And then uh, this gets prepared and ready for us on a Sunday morning uh, by a team that wakes up quite early and gets here earlier than most of us. And so we want to thank them. Um, I don't want to uh, mention specific names and just now they feel um, exposed and embarrassed. Um, but we, we do want to thank all those who work um, early on a Sunday morning and get things here and set up uh, to make possible for us to, to, to be here and to just come and get our seats and to worship. And so thank you uh, to all those who, who work um, behind the scenes. Well, at this time we begin our time of worship. And as usual, we begin our time of worship with a call to prayer, or with a call to worship, I should say, with a call to worship. And our call to worship is taken from Psalm 29 this morning, Psalm 29. And this is a time where we hear God's word and we um, allow God's word by the power of His Spirit to draw our hearts out to worship God. It's a time where we fix our, our minds, a time where we set our hearts right. It's a time where we focus to, and to read to ready ourselves to, to begin a time of worship together. So Psalm 29 um, will do that this morning or does that for us this morning. Psalm 29 verse 1. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The, he makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. May the Lord bless his, the reading of his word and our time together this morning. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we give thanks this morning for yet another opportunity we have to come together and worship you. We do pray as we meet now, Lord, that you would meet with us, O oh God. We thank you for this week you've given us, and we thank you for your provision, your sustenance, Lord. We thank you for your care, O oh God, and we thank you for your protection, dear Lord. And even as we have seen out this week by your grace, we continue to look to you, O oh God, for this day and this new week that lie ahead. And as we begin this new week, in your house, Lord, with your people, with a time of worship, O oh God, we pray that you would build us up, Lord. We pray that you would strengthen us. We ask, O oh God, that you would help us, Lord, 
We pray, Lord, that you would enable us to walk more faithfully before you. We thank you, O God, that we see in your word, Lord, that you are the God of this world. You are the God of creation. You are the God of all things, O Lord. You have created everything and you command all things from the weather to the animals to um, human beings, O Lord. You command us all, O God. And in your temple, we ought to cry glory because all of this is for your renown, for your fame, and for your glory O oh God and so even as we meet here help us to know Lord that you are not merely the God over the Christian um, st the Christian's time on a Sunday morning but you are the God over all you are the Lord of Lords the God of gods you are the creator of the heavens and the earth you are the ruler O oh God you are the Lord of hosts and so as we remember this this morning we ask that you would bless us O oh Lord we pray, O oh God, that you would bless the gathering, Lord. Even as we give attention to the preaching of your word, we pray that you would speak to us, Lord. Thank you for your servant, your instrument this morning, Lord, who you will use, Lord. And so we pray, O oh God, that you would help us to hear, to listen, and to believe, even as we hear your word this morning. We ask you these mercies in the precious name of Christ our Savior, with thanksgiving. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with me as we... Uh, sing our first and opening hymn, Amazing Grace.
sing of His grace and we sing of His goodness and this is fitting for us to do. What is also fitting for us to do is to give attention to the public reading of God's Word and so as it is our practice to read out loud the Scriptures, we will do that this morning as well. We'll have a reading from the Old Testament and a reading from the New Testament and this is intended to nourish us and feed us as we call to mind the words of Jesus who taught us that man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God and so this is what we live on namely God's word this is what nourishes us and this is what builds us up the hearing the receiving the believing and the doing of God's word and so we give attention to that this morning our Old Testament reading comes out of the book of Ecclesiastes I'd encourage you just to hear God's word as I read it out loud but for those who would like to turn there, you are most welcome to do that too. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and we'll read from verse 1 through to verse 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 from verse 1 through to verse 7. Hear the word of the Lord. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth. Nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore let your words be few. For a dream comes with much busyness, or with much business, and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. And here, we have a, here we have a passage of scripture that calls us to fear God, to know who He is, to know who we are, and to know how we ought to appropriately relate to God, whom the Bible reminds us here is in heaven and we are on earth. And so God is God and we are not. And this is why we must be circumspect. This is why we must walk reverently before Him as we honor Him in word and in deed. May the Lord bless the reading of His word. Our second reading comes from the Gospels. It comes from the New Testament and it's from the Lord's Sermon on the Mount and it comes from Matthew chapter 6. It's a very common and known passage of Scripture. It's um, commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer. And so this is what we'll read this morning. In fact, as I read, I'd encourage you to pray the prayer even as you sit quietly in your heart. You're welcome to pray this prayer. It will be right for us to do so and, and, and only fitting. And so I read from Matthew chapter 6 from verse 5 through to verse 15 and Jesus teaches us on prayer generally Matthew chapter 6 from verse 5 and when you pray you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others truly I say to you they have received their reward but when you pray go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And here we have a familiar teaching from Jesus on the importance of prayer and of course on the importance of seeking God's forgiveness and then also forgiving others who have 
around us and these things work together as the Lord teaches us here. What is of interest is we are encouraged to go into our closet. We are encouraged to go into the, that secret place to pray. We, we are not encouraged to pray so that we can be seen or pray for applause. But even though we are encouraged to go into that secret place to pray where only God hears us, we do not go self, selfishly. We go into our closet, into that secret place to pray, to pray. And in our prayer, we still pray, give us this day our daily bread forgive us and we're still in that secret place when we are all alone and just us just you and god we still remember others in our time of prayer and so may we heed these words and may the lord bless the reading of his word but at this time we turn to god as we come before his throne of grace we remember our sins and we remember our savior and the forgiveness of sins that there is to be found in him and we confess our sins as a church, corporately, we've confessed our sins during this time of, of the service. And so, even as I pray now, I encourage you also to call to mind the times in which you have not done what God has called you to do or failed to do what God has asked you to do. And at this time, it will be appropriate for you to confess your sins and ask God for grace and strength so that you can walk pleasing before Him and in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Well, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for calling us, O oh God, to pray. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the opportunity we have to come before you. We are not a bother to you. We are not a nuisance to you. We are not disturbing you when we pray, Lord. This is what you want. This is what you will. And this is what you welcome, O oh God. And so we thank you this morning for this opportunity we have to come before the throne of grace, knowing, Lord, that we find there seated on this throne a savior a lord and we thank you this morning that in him we have the forgiveness of sins we thank you that all those who place their trust in jesus all those who believe in him receive the forgiveness of sins and so this morning we are mindful that we are not perfect oh god at least not yet we are not glorified yet in our current physical state with this fallen human nature that we still carry with us and so we are not without sin and this is what your word teaches us he who says is without sin lies and the truth is not in him and so this morning being mindful of god about our failures of our weaknesses and of our sin lord being mindful of our transgressions oh lord god and where we violate your word being mindful of the wickedness of our hearts and what conspires in our what, what, what happens in our thought life oh god knowing that you see all of this lord even that which others do not see you see our thoughts you know our thoughts you know our words even before it's on our tongue you discern our actions oh lord you weigh our motives oh lord and you know us better than we know ourselves because our hearts are often weak, wicked, Lord, and deceitful and deceive us into thinking that our noble intentions are actually noble, that our good works are actually good when it's not in fact that, Lord. And so we take this opportunity to come before you this morning, Lord, understanding as we have heard in your word that we ought to fear you, understanding as we have been reading in your word that we ought to walk reverently before you, we come, Lord, only because of Jesus Christ, our Savior, only because we've got an advocate with the Father. And we come and we ask you to forgive us our sins, forgive us our trespasses, and help us, Lord, to forgive those who have sinned against us. Cleanse us from our unrighteousness, Lord, and lead us into a path that is righteous. For your name's sake, O oh God. We thank you for the grace that is to be found in Jesus. Oh, that all would come and believe on him and have their sins forgiven and be cleansed from their unrighteousness and live believingly before him. But thank you that you've called us to trust him and believe in him. And so help us, O oh Lord, to not, be, to not be coddled into a false sense of security and assurance in thinking that we can sin, Lord, because there's always grace. But help us to be mindful in this hour that the grace you give us not only excuses us from sin, Lord, but empowers us, Lord. 
empowers us to live righteously, to live holy. And so as we pray now, we ask that you would give us the strength, Lord, to perform your will, to do your will, to be faithful and to be obedient. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Fill us with the Spirit of God so that we would be like God, imitate God, be Christ-like, be Godly. So I pray that you would help us in this regard. Thank you for the grace that is to be found in Jesus. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins that is part of the spiritual blessings laid up for us who believe. Continue to bless us, Lord, even as we give ourselves now, Lord, to worship you in song. And even as we hear the word of God proclaim, we ask your blessing upon the furtherance of this meeting. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me one more time as we sing our second hymn? When peace like a river attendeth my way.
God's word for us this morning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here this morning. I wasn't initially scheduled to preach but I'm, I'm happy to do so this morning and uh, God willing next week um, I will be with you as well. If you have your Bibles please turn to Psalm 130 But before I read, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity today to gather in your name, to sing praises to your, to your name, for you are worthy. Thank you, Lord, for your word, and um, that you're a God that has spoken truth to us. Lord, my prayer this morning is quite simple, that by your spirit, that just as this psalm magnifies your name, your name might be magnified in our midst, for I pray this for your name's sake. Amen. Psalm 130. Um, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning. More than watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let me ask you a question this morning as I start. Are you happy? <laughs> I hear one yes. <laughs> I suspect that for many of you, the answer would be no. So let me ask you another question. What do you think is the biggest obstacle to your happiness that you are facing right now? I suspect for many, what would come most readily to mind is this pandemic, this lingering impact. It was about a year ago, wasn't it, that we went into lockdown. Who would have said that a year later we would still be following these protocols? And there's no doubt that this pandemic has had a huge physical and economic impact. Perhaps others of you might identify some difficulties in relationships, a failed relationship. Maybe it's some other health concern, maybe not in yourself, but in someone else that is weighing you down and is undermining your happiness. But if I had to ask you again, what do you think is the biggest obstacle? I wonder how many of you would say sin, S-I-N. Indeed, I wonder if you would view sin as an obstacle to happiness at all. In our text this morning, Psalm 130, the psalmist identifies sin as a great obstacle. An obstacle that causes distress because it hinders worship and service to God. Now, in my Bible, at the, the top of the psalm, there's a title, they're saying, A Song of Ascent. And so this... The title of the psalm identifies this as one of several songs that 
religious pilgrims would probably have sung as they were on their way to worship God in the temple at Jerusalem. And so this concern about sin makes perfect sense because the pilgrim would have viewed their relationship with God as a priority. That's why they're making this pilgrimage. And they would understand that sin would undermine or threaten this relationship and so in a sense undermine the very purpose of pilgrimage. I want you to notice how the psalm begins with an urgent plea, verses 1 and 2. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. One translation states, From the deep waters I cry out to you, O Lord. Deep waters. Like someone about to drown. I, in my long life, have had to be rescued twice from drowning. If I hadn't been rescued, I would have drowned. The deep waters would have got me. Horrible, horrible feeling, sense of helplessness. That's kind of the picture here. Notice the depths of the psalmist's distress as he repeatedly seeks to draw the Lord's attention to his plight. Hear my voice, or as one translation says, hear my cry. Be attentive to my pleas, plural. You get the sense of him crying out with a great sense of urgency. You know, when you read through the Psalms, again and again, you'll see that the, the psalmist encounters all kinds of problems. And here again, if you think about a, a, a pilgrim on the way to worship at the temple in Jerusalem, the problem, the cry can be related to one of many things. Depression, homesickness, persecution, the threat of enemies along the way. But that's not the concern here, that's not the problem. Rather, the psalmist pleads for mercy. Hear my cry, he says, for mercy. Be attentive to my pleas for mercy. The psalmist is crying out to God that God would not treat him according to what his deeds deserve. Why? Because he recognizes that no one, including himself, can stand guiltless before God. Look with me at verse 3. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities... You should keep a record. Oh Lord, who could stand? The psalmist recognizes that nothing is hidden from God. You know, we come here in our respectable Sunday best, put on a tie. It's the only time I wear ties when I'm preaching. <laughs> and then we can hide our true self, can't we? But nothing is hidden from God. And the psalmist understands that. O oh Lord, if you should mark iniquities, who of us could stand? The, common, the Book of Common Prayer agrees with the psalmist. I recall as a younger person praying this prayer every Sunday as I went to church. Almighty and most merciful God, we have erred. Notice the we. We. We have erred. And we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. You see, clearly the psalmist, clearly the Book of Common Prayer agrees with the psalmist. None of us can stand. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. This is a prayer that God's people pray regularly, Sunday by Sunday, as they gather. See, this prayer recognizes that we have left undone those things which we ought to have done. For example, love, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
We have left these things undone. Why? Because, as one writer says, the problem with sin is that it makes us self-focused. Self-obsessed. We are concerned to meet our own needs. Rion mentioned earlier that prayer, you know, give us this day our daily bread. We, we, we're very quick to pray for our own needs, but perhaps slow to pray for the needs of others. But as the prayer book acknowledges, there's no health in us, in us. We're spiritually sick. The problem is within us. That's why David prays in Psalm 51, Lord, create within me a clean heart. Jesus said in another context, he says, it's not the things that go into us that defile us, but it's the things that come from within us that defile us. Perhaps, you see, you want to blame your circumstances. Perhaps you find yourself in very difficult circumstances. And you want to blame your circumstances for your sins and your failures. The Word of God is very clear, my friends. The problem is within us. The problem is us. And this guilt causes the psalmist great anguish because he, like all of us, must one day stand before the Lord. And who can stand? See, my friends, the Lord is holy, righteous, and just. He cannot simply overlook our sin. As the Apostle John says in a different context, he says, God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. None at all. The same cannot be said of you and I. There's no health in us. The psalmist's de desperate cry hints at the enormity of the problem that the sinner faces. And the cry, the urgency of the cry indicates that, my friends, it's beyond our human ability to solve. I could not save myself from drowning. I had to be rescued. I'd helped my daughter get out of trouble and it exhausted me to the extent that I couldn't make it to shore. I needed rescuing. I could not save myself. But the good news is, my friends, in the psalm there is hope. Look at verses 4 and following. With the Lord there is forgiveness. But with the Lord. Don't you love it? But God. But God. It's a wonderful simplicity, but note of certainty. With the Lord there is forgiveness. But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen waiting for the morning. More than watchmen waiting for the morning. The psalmist makes clear, my friends, here that it's the Lord, but only the Lord in whom we can have hope. Notice the repetition here again to emphasize the point. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. Repetition. Reinforcement. These are pictures of intense desire. Even more, he says, and he repeats it, even more than the night watchman who longs for the morning. Why does he long for the morning? Because the shift will end. The psalmist desires the Lord's forgiveness. If you're a night watchman, you long for the morning, for the light. What you're looking forward to. And that's the picture. More than the watchman, more than the watchman. Plural. He wants God's forgiveness. The morning brings light. The Lord's forgiveness brings life. The Lord's forgiveness here is so marvelous that according to the psalmist, it generates fear. Isn't that interesting? This forgiveness, my friends, is so great 
It's so awesome. It's so amazing that it generates fear, reverence. One writer says this, this, this fear is not the fear of punishment. Quite the opposite. It is motivated by a sense of how overwhelmingly kind, good and merciful God is to sinful human beings who deserve his punishment. Disbelief that God would be so forgiving to sinners. Spurgeon puts it this way, this kind of fear leans towards the Lord because of his goodness. We are drawn to God. We are drawn to this divine being who can forgive sinners. And my friends, it's no surprise when you think about the pictures that the Bible uses to explain the glory and the blessing of forgiveness. Think about the psalmist crying out desperately, urgently, Lord, be merciful, Lord, be merciful. Oh, with the Lord, he says, there is forgiveness. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has the Lord removed our transgressions from us. How far is the east from the west? Well, we, we really can't answer that, isn't it? It's just, we keep going. The point is our sins will never trouble us again, those who are forgiven. Isaiah 38 verse 17, God puts all our sins behind his back. Not literally, but it means that those sins will never be seen again. God will never hold them against us. Is that a beautiful picture? Takes my sins and hides them behind his back. Micah 7, 19. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Never to be found again. With the Lord, there is forgiveness. No wonder King David writes in Psalm 32, Blessed is the one, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. God hiding our sins, God covering our sins. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Think about that, my friends. When the Lord forgives you, he will never, ever count your sin against you. It's not that God forgets our sins. It's not that God doesn't know, but God will never, ever hold that sin against us. No wonder the psalm ends off by the psalmist commending the Lord to all Israel. There's no one like this God, my friends. He is worthy to be known. Who is this God who forgives like this? Who is this God that is so merciful? Some commentators suggest that this particular psalm may be a post-exilic psalm, which simply means it was written after Israel returned to the land after the exile. You can imagine their state of mind, the darkness, the lingering darkness, the despair, the depression, being downcast, having failed God. Is there any hope for us as God's people? But you see, the psalmist gives a resounding yes. He reminds God, he reminds Israel of the Lord, verses 7 and 8. Put your hope in the Lord, Israel. Now the focus is not just on the psalmist, but it's all Israel. Because with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. He will redeem Israel from all her iniquity. All her sin and guilt. Notice that according to verse 7, the Lord's forgiveness is motivated by his steadfast love. 
Israel is not disqualified by her lack of merit. Did Israel lack merit? Yes, they did, because they ended up in exile. But the psalmist understands the mercy and the grace and the love of God. This love, my friends, is a steadfast love. It means it's an unchanging love. Why? Because it's not dependent on what we do or we don't do. It's dependent on God. We do nothing to earn that forgiveness, and so we can do nothing to lose that forgiveness. It's an amazing thought. Steadfast love. It's something we all long for when we get married, not so steadfast love. And yet I think we will be quick to confess that we don't experience that, even in our marriages. But God is not like that. Steadfast. Trustworthy. He will never, ever leave you. And of course the New Testament points out that this love, this steadfast love, is clearly displayed in the Lord's provision of a substitute sin sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sins. How can it be that God can be so merciful? How can it be that we can stand before God? How can it be that God can forgive us? Because, my friends, He has sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for us. John 3.16, you know that verse so well. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. You want proof of God's steadfast love, my friends? You look at the Lord Jesus Christ, His person, His work, and His death on the cross. His resurrection, vindicating Him. It is Jesus' merit that saves us. That's why he says in verse 8, the Lord's redemption is plentiful. It extends to all iniquities. No sin is too great. See, I love those words in the scripture, plentiful. All. A small word, but an important word. Some of us might think there are things that we've done in our lives that God can't, can't forgive us. One of the courses that I teach at the, at the college, at the Bible Institute, is, is, the, is a course on the book of, of Acts. And in fact, I've just uh, finished teaching at this last quarter, busy marking the students' exams. <laughs> day of judgment, their day of judgment. <laughs> Fortunately, they've all been able to stand. <laughs> But it's very interesting, you know, in, in Acts chapter 3, there's a wonderful illustration, a powerful illustration of this point that no matter what our sins, no matter how great our sins, there is still forgiveness. The Apostle Paul is preaching. He's just healed a man who was lame from birth. There's great commotion now in the temple. Everyone's gathering around him and, and he begins to preach. And then in the course of preaching, obviously he's speaking now to, to, to the people of Israel, the temple. And he speaks there in verse 19. He says of, if you repent and turn, he says, your sins will be blotted out. Your sins will be blotted out. What is significant about this promise is that in verse 15, three or four verses prior to this, the Apostle Peter accuses them, listen to this, of putting the author of life to death. You have killed the author of life, he says. They didn't literally nail Jesus to the cross, but he says, you kill the author of life. Can you think of a more grievous sin before God the Father? And yet to this very group of people, he says, if you repent and turn from your sins, God will blot out your sin. He will blot it out. Even this sin, even this grievous sin, is not too great for God's mercy. 
That word blot out occurs a number of different places in the New Testament. Let me draw your attention just to one. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, Revelation 21 verse 4. So the context here is heaven, glory, new heavens and new earth. And it says there that God will one day in heaven blot out or wipe away every tear. Is that a beautiful picture? There's going to be no more death, no more suffering, no more mourning, no more pain. God will wipe away every tear. And my friends, that's the same word that's used in Acts chapter 3. Peter's point is that just as God will one day wipe away every tear, so my friends, when you repent and turn from your sins, God will wipe away the guilt of everyone of your sins. Let me make some comments by way of application and conclusion. It should be clear from the psalmist's opening plea that sin is a serious problem. A serious obstacle to true and lasting happiness. Whether or not like the psalmist this morning as you sit here, whether you recognize the depth of your need for, for the Lord's mercy, my friends, the fact remains that we have fallen short of God's glory. And the problem is one day we need to stand before God to give an account. And my friends, in your own righteousness, you will not stand. Don't let the current pandemic blind you to the greatest obstacle to your true and lasting happiness. I don't want to minimize the impact of the pandemic. But my friends, don't let that blind you to the problem and the obstacle of sin, to true and lasting happiness. What the psalmist is doing here, he's pointing us to eternity. He says you have to have an eternal perspective. You've got to look beyond this life. You've got to understand that a day of reckoning will come. What is a prophet a man, says Jesus, if they gain the whole world, world but lose their life? You can have the wealth of Bill Gates, but my friends, there's no room to negotiate. It's not enough. You can't buy your way out of this. The good news is that with the Lord, with the Lord alone, there is the blessing of forgiveness plentiful redemption from all iniquities I don't know what's going on in your life I don't know your CV I don't know your your heart but I can tell you this morning that if the Lord can redeem Israel from all her sins all iniquity my friends he can do the same for you don't let the sin and shame and guilt keep you from him this morning but I want you to notice verse 7. This forgiveness is not automatic. You must put your hope in the Lord. Put your hope in the Lord. Oh my friends. What a wonderful God this is. A God whose love is steadfast and unchanging. Don't miss the fact that the psalm ends up on such a positive, certain and glorious note. You know, as I was preparing this message, meditating on the psalm, it suddenly struck me. The psalm, yes, it's about forgiveness, but it's actually about the Lord. I count at least 15 references in eight verses to the Lord. And I suddenly realized, you know, this is, this is, about, this is about the Lord God. What the psalmist is doing, he's praising God. He's extolling the virtues of this God. Do you want proof that this God is wonderful? Do you want proof that this God is amazing? He says, look at the way he forgives sin. Have you ever? My friends, is it not true that you and I sometimes find it very difficult to forgive others? But we heard in, the, in, the, in that reading today, forgive others as we have forgiven them. It's the mark of the Christian. Why? Because that's the mark of God. 
Do you think it was easy for God to forgive? No, he had to send his son to pay the penalty. The Lord will save us from our sins even though we don't deserve it. But because it's all the Lord's doing, notice how he ends on a, a note of praise. We can, like the psalmist, have absolute confidence that our complete forgiveness is secure for all eternity. I trust this morning that I'm kind of preaching to the choir. By that I simply mean that, that you've put your hope in the Lord. But my friends, I don't for a moment want to assume that that's true. Think about Judas. Our Lord called him, spent three years, but he was a son of perdition. I don't know your heart, but God does. And so I would challenge you, I would encourage you this morning to put your hope in the Lord. He will never fail you. But what happens if you are a forgiven believer? Oh, my friends, meditate, understand, grasp, revel, rejoice in God's forgiveness. Thank the Lord that he's heard your cry for mercy because you know it's not based on merit. Thank the Lord that he's opened the door to your true and lasting happiness. The best is yet to come. But because it's God who forgives, the best will come. Declare his praises to all who will listen. Like the psalmist, you see, who cries out to Israel, put your hope in the Lord. Testify to one and all that the Lord, with the Lord, there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. Plentiful redemption. Your sins will not exhaust God's grace and mercy. Our sins. You're never going to cry out to God and put your hope in this. Sorry, too late. Because it's based on the merits, the matchless merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. Truly, my friends, we serve a wonderful God who has secured a true and lasting happiness for his people. Don't keep this truth to yourselves. Share it with others. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this morning. This really is about you. What a wonderful God. Help us this morning, Lord, as your people, just to pause. To pause in humility and gratitude and fear, reverence. For so great is your forgiveness and your mercy. So wonderful is your plentiful redemption that forgives all our iniquities. Thank you for your great love, a love so great that you gave your only son to die for those who were so unworthy. Let's take a moment just to quietly reflect. Let's stand up for the, to receive, uh, it's really a doxology, let's stand together as I read.
typically we give a benediction, which is a blessing. Doxology is when we praise God, and I think given the sermon this morning, I think it's very fitting that we, we do give praise and, and honor and glory to our wonderful, wonderful God, God of the Scriptures, the God who forgives us. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen.